You wrote a, a pamphlet or a book on uh, the death of Aldo Moro. Can you can you sum up some of your um, findings in that? Well, the basic uh, finding is that uh, it was the Red Brigades, uh, to the extent they were involved, are a tool and a creation of NATO intelligence. Uh, the Bader-Meinhof group in Germany and the Red Brigades in Italy have the same thing in common. They're in two countries, the, the defeated countries of World War II, that had centrifugal tendencies out of NATO into neutralism uh, in the case of Germany or towards the Third World in the case of Italy, right? The idea of being a bridge into the Arab world and the Middle East and the oil producers. And the U.S. Uh, and the British simply did not want to tolerate that. And the form that, that the Italian one would have taken would have been the entrance of the Italian Communist Party into the government, which was a plan by Kissinger, I'm sorry, by, uh, by Berlinguer, the communist, and by Moro, the Christian Democratic leader, the historical compromise, as it was known. So Moro was associated with this. Uh, it was being done under an Andriotti government. And uh, in the spring of 1978, he was kidnapped and then murdered by uh, terrorists. Uh, and these turned out to be the Red Brigades, but again, the Red Brigades are a branch of NATO intelligence, and that was the finding. Uh, at that time, some people said it was homegrown Italian Red Brigades terrorism. No. Some people accused the Soviets. No. Uh, U.S., British dominated NATO intelligence. And there is a special role for Kissinger, which is that after the dossier was published, Mo uh, Moro's widow said that, he, that Moro had been threatened by a very prominent leader of American foreign policy. Some people have concluded that this was Kissinger. Uh, it's plausible. Uh, but many, many, many Italians would say, hang on, uh, we, we can have our own leftist uh, violent movement. It's no. a homegrown thing. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a farce because it, the Red Brigades, the first generation of the Red Brigades come out of the faculty of the Department of Sociology of the University of Trento. And they were taught by any number of uh, sociologists about, uh, well, the kind of thing you saw them do then later on. So they're a fully uh, artificial group. In other words, totally synthetic in the sense that they're created as a sociological project in a new university that had been just created studying sociology. And then as the years go by, they make a name for themselves as a student group. And then the original student activists, I consider them brainwashed patsies, people like Curcio, Renato Curcio, Mara Cagol, who was actually shot, uh, they get eliminated, arrested, and then in come other people, a certain Mario Moretti, widely considered to be a CIA agent, uh, and, and some others of that type. And they become more and more violent and more and more brutal. And you get people coming in who are actually neo-fascists in their uh, background, others who are criminal elements. Uh, the intelligence agencies get their tentacles in there. The Mossad is monitoring it. Uh, NATO is running it. And, uh, and I think that's what you then get. And the target selection for the Red Brigades makes no sense from the point of view of the Italian working class, but it makes all the sense in the world from the point of view of NATO. So the assassination of Moro was part of a wider pattern? Yeah, the, it's, it's a pattern of geopolitical or spheres of influence terrorism, uh, which comes down to the idea that if Germany wants to launch an independent foreign policy uh, not, not under the thumb of NATO, but open to, for example, uh, Germany needs to create export markets in Africa through real economic development. Not IMF austerity, not World Bank conditionality, but, uh, but real economic development. The bankers involved in this, Jürgen Ponto, Alfred Herrhausen, uh, Detlev Karsten Rohwedder over the years, and all of them assassinated by the bader meinhof group. So again, the target list, the question of who benefits, cui bono, cui protest, is always makes sense from a NATO point of view, but never from, from a German point of view. In the case of Italy, the, the, the previous question had been Enrico Mattei, the, the head of the Italian state oil company, Eni, and his method had been to go to Egypt, to go to Algeria, to go to Iran, to make deals on an equal partnership, 50-50 basis, he was beginning to cut out the Anglo-American cartel, the Seven Sisters, 
BP, Royal Dutch, Texaco, Exxon, Mobil, uh, Chevron, the rest of these, they were getting cut out. And then uh, he, this was back at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. His uh, jet aircraft was sabotaged by the CIA and that was the end of him. He was murdered. So there's a the tradition of it and the means change. And uh, as you get into the 60s, it becomes something called the strategy of tension, which means that the NATO intelligence can deploy various assets. They blow up bombs in Milan, kill about 20 people in December of 1969. That's the beginning. It goes through many, many episodes. And then the Bologna uh, railway station bombing of about 1980 80 to 81 kills about 80 people. It's the biggest uh, terrorist action in Europe until the Madrid bombs. Now, they have, obviously they have left-wing networks. They have, they have people who were OSS or British agents in the anti-Nazi resistance who remain primarily uh, CIA and British assets and they can be recycled in and their weapons can be recycled in and were. They also have the fact that Alan Dulles, in particular for Italy, had made a secret surrender. Remember, SS General Carl Wolf was going to surrender directly to the U.S. and Italy, not, not to the Allies, which is what Stalin wanted. It was a big flap. So it means that a lot of the Italian fascists had turned uh, to supporting the U.S. Uh, and the British. And after the war, uh, basically when you get into the late 50s and early 60s, more or less, is when it becomes official, they have something called Gladio, which is a stay-behind network. And the, the reasoning is, if the Soviet Red Army arrives, we've got to uh, be able to launch a resistance, right? Terrorism, as it would be called by, by the occupier. And uh, we've got to have weapons, we've got to have explosives, we've got to have trained people, we've got to have a cadre force. In other words, it's a group of two or 3,000 people who are really all officers. In other words, they could take in large, large numbers of, of rank-and-file enlisted people. And uh, they have bases, they have, they have uh, arms deposits all over the place. And one of the people involved in this is a Christian Democratic partisan working for the U.S. and the British already during the war, Edgardo Sogno, S-O-G-N-O, -O, is sort of Mr. Gladio. So what they do then with Gladio is they say, well, um, we're going to launch guerrilla warfare if the Soviets arrive. And then they say, well, we better launch guerrilla warfare if the communists get into the government. And then they say, well, we better launch guerrilla warfare before the communists get into the government. We better have a strategy of tension. So what they do is in the biggest post-war uh, strike wave of European history, the so-called Italian hot autumn of 1969, they decide to set off this bomb in a bank in Milan, killing almost 20 people, which breaks the strike wave. In other words, it takes the strike wave, it smashes it, and it turns it into this uh, nightmare of a reign of terror by the police who can now go and arrest. They can arrest all the trade union activists on suspicion that they're part of the bombing, and they do, and they, they round them up, and they beat them up, and they do all this stuff, and that works. And that, after that, there's a, there's a kind of an addiction, right? A, a ruling class that becomes addicted to terrorism is like a heroin addict. They need more and more and more, so they keep getting more, more and more and more. So that's Gladio. Gladio is this stay-behind network that is, it's officially constituted under General Lyman Lemnitzer, who is the Pentagon general who argued for nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis. He wanted to nuke Russia. And he's also the one who wrote the Operation Northwoods paper, which you can see in my book, 9-11 Synthetic Terror Made in USA. Is a, it's a program to provoke a war with Cuba by uh, false flag provocations coming from the U.S. side. And it's also then used, it's not used against Cuba, but it is used against North Vietnam. It starts the Vietnam War in the form of the Gulf of Tonkin incident. So this guy Lemnitzer is the one who presides over the official creation of Gladio, 63, 64, 65, and the creation of the first arms deposits and the creation of the first official teams of saboteurs and terrorists and, and other stuff. And again, they don't wait for the Soviets. They start doing it right away, so they're doing it all through the 70s and into the 80s. In the background of this also, the P2 Lodge, Propaganda Due, I've, I've met quite a few members without knowing it at the time. And this is a, essentially a U.S.-British creation. Propaganda Uno, P1 Freemasonic Lodge, 
was created by Mazzini. And you have to know that Mazzini was a British agent working for the Admiralty. Uh, his case officer was a guy called James Stansfeld, who was the great uh, prophet of Italian unification here in Britain. Uh, he was attacked by Disraeli for having been hobnobbing with the assassins of Europe, Mazzini, the leading assassin of Europe. So Stansfeld uh, had, uh, had done all these things. There is no doubt that Mazzini was a British agent. He created the P1 Lodge. Mussolini wiped it out for all practical purposes because he didn't want to tolerate other centers of power. So then after World War II, the US and the British jointly create the P2 Lodge, Propaganda Due, and that's Licio Gelli, Ortolani, but then a whole list of other people. Uh, everybody who wants to be anybody has to join it. Andreotti, Berlusconi, they all have to join it. Um, and that is a kind of um, clearinghouse for journalists, politicians, the heads of companies, professors who are going to be active in supporting uh, these activities. In other words, they're going to do propaganda backup and mass brainwashing in favor of terrorism, right? Saying it's really the Communist Party, they are violent, can't let them in the government, all the rest of this stuff. So that's a kind of a thumbnail sketch of post-war spheres of influence or geopolitical terrorism. And again, the Badermeinhof group and the Italian Red Brigades are both designed to maintain the Yalta line of demarcation, that everything west of the line belongs to the U.S and the British, and are not independent countries, but are under, they're under a kind of limited sovereignty, Brezhnev doctrine, uh, but, but in the West.